Um, Zechariah, are we in Zechariah yet? We'll go to Matthew and turn left. Okay, so, so applying the methods we spoke about today, uh, Zechariah is um, a Persian period prophet. So the people have returned from exile. Yeah? The people of it is towards the end of the 6th century, low 500s BCE. The people have returned from exile and the, they're under the rule, the dominance of the Persian Empire. And he's speaking to the returned exiles, the returned exilic community in and around Jerusalem. Now, his name is really, really significant. Um, the Yah at the end, obviously, Zachariah, so Zachariah, is the, what we call the theophoric element, which is the element of God's name in his own personal name. And this was a very common practice. You'll find a lot of the prophets have YH at the end of their name, or they'll have L for God in their name as well. So the theophoric, like Ezekiel, right? <coughs> Now, the root is zakar, which means to remember. Remember what we were talking about earlier, about covenantal remembrance. And it's a very, very fundamental term, actually. If you go back to Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3 from verse 13. And this is one of the most fundamental verses in the whole of the Bible. Moses said unto God, you notice that Moses said unto God, yeah? Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel, and I shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they'll say to me, quite naturally, What's his name? What shall I say to them? And the first statement from God is very much putting them in their place. Mm -hmm. you, you... God said unto Moses, I shall be what I shall be. Now, that's not his name. The, the name of God, the God's personal name has nothing to do with the verb to be. I've heard that said in a lot of Christian circles. It's just not true. It's a myth. Because um, it's the wrong language, essentially. It could be the verb to be in Aramaic, but the Bible's mostly in Hebrew, and this is all Hebrew, so it's just not the case. Okay. Um, God says to Moses here, we often translate it, I am what I am, but it's, Echie, I shall be what I shall be. It's the, what we call grammatic, because Hebrew doesn't have tenses. There's no past, present, future in Hebrew. In Hebrew, you have accomplished action, action that's been done and it's accomplished, and inaccomplished action. And this is the imperfect, the inaccomplished action here. In other words, God's saying, yep, I was what I was, I am what I am, but I'm going to keep being what I'm going to be. <laughs> it's in other words, that me being myself is never going to come to an end. So it's never going to be accomplished because it's always going to be the case that I am going to be who I'm going to be. Only God can say that. Yeah. So who are you? First answer that comes back is actually quite dismissive. What's it to you? I will be who I will be. Understand your place compared to me. All right. It's quite an awesome thing that he says so say to the children of israel i will be has <laughs> sent me unto you then the grace of god and he does reveal his name <coughs> god more said more over to moses you shall say unto the children of israel and then he says his name and then he says after saying his name the god of your fathers the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. So God is gracious, and he has revealed his name at certain 
points. <coughs> but understand, honor, respect, and know know where you are in relation to him. You see. And then he says, at the end of verse fifteen. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. This is my name forever. And this is my remembrance unto all generations. You can translate it memorial or remembrance. It's the, it's the memory word. Now, there's a lot of poetry in the Bible. Like large parts of the book of Isaiah. All the, all the Psalms. Lots of poetry in the Bible. But anybody know how Hebrew poetry works? It doesn't rhyme. Okay, Hebrew poetry, that it works by rhythm, works by metre. And it works through repetition, what we call poetic parallelism. What's that wonderful passage in um, Isaiah? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. So wounded goes with <coughs> bruised. Transgressions goes with iniquities. You repeat the idea using different language to help often explain it. Sometimes the repetition can be what we call antithetical. It's the opposite idea that comes out. So he was wounded for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, in other words, chastisement, we are healed. So that's clearly the healing is, is salvation because it's the chastisement of our shalom. Right. So you, un you interpret these things looking at the parallel phrases the whole time. This is an example here of God employing parallelism when explaining his own identity. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. So forever unto all generations. Yeah, they're equivalent, which means that name is equivalent to what? This, right, watch my hands here. This is my name forever. This is my remembrance to all generations. So this equals this. Forever equals unto all generations. What are we left with? Name, remembrance. Do you see? Name and remembrance are identical in this passage. So think about the significance of the name of God. What does the name of God signify? Eternity. His character. Exactly. Can you say that again? Nice his and character. His character. See, in the Bible, the significance of naming, it's the last act of creation. Yes? The moment you have a name, you have identity. That's the beauty of Adam being asked to name the animals. God is welcoming Adam into the creative process and saying, here you go, Adam, put the icing on the cake. Complete the creation by giving this thing a name. So when you say to God, what's your name? It's actually quite a bit of an upstart thing to do because you're saying that I, just as I can say that's a leopard. That's why God is like, no, I will be who I will be. Now he then goes, he does reveal his name, but that's a big deal. This is my name and it's the covenant name. Associated with the covenant name is the concept of remembrance. Now think about what's about to happen here. What's about to happen here is Moses is about to go back and we're about to have the Passover. We're about to have the people redeemed by the blood of the lamb out of Egypt. In other words, the covenant put into effect. Yeah. And it's at that moment that God reveals his name and links it with the notion of remembrance. So there's, it's a covenantal remembrance. Right. God chooses at a particular point in time to remember his covenant. It's not because he'd gone down the shops and neglected to get something. It's not that kind of forgetting and remembering. It is the Lord in his sovereignty saying, now I remember my people and their affliction. 
Now is the day of their deliverance. Now is the day when I remember the covenant and make it happen. Right? Now, centuries later, when the children of Israel are taken into exile in Babylon, and they're left in exile in Babylon, and when they come back after their time in exile, and they're really struggling, and things are going really, really bad. Now, remember, the prophet Isaiah said about this. He, talk, he talked about the returns from returnees from exile. He said, therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion talking about the Jews coming out of exile in Babylon and being restored to their land. In other words, about covenant being reapplied, the Lord remembering once more. And the people are back and they're suffering and the prophet that arises to bring comfort and encouragement to them is called the remembrance of the Lord. You see, the remembrance of the Lord. It's a covenantal term covenantal remembrance now is that making sense so far is that clear so they come back let's go back to Zechariah now the people are led back by two leaders I mentioned them earlier on Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor now I'm skipping a bit but in Zechariah chapter 3 you get the introduction of Joshua the high priest and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. To Now Satan means one who is your adversary. And if you read this in the Hebrew, you'll notice that it doesn't say Satan with a capital S. Because there are no capital letters in Hebrew. The other thing it says in the Hebrew is the Satan. The Satan. Ha Satan. And in Hebrew, you can never put ha, the, before a proper noun, before a proper name. In, you can say this in English. In English, you can say the Siam. In Hebrew, you can't do that. So this here says the Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Because the Satan is basically the adversary. It's not a personal name, certainly at this point anyway. Actually, there are lots of Satans in the Bible. Lots of people in the Bible are called the Satan or a Satan, small s. And a lot of them are human. They can be a military adversary, a political rival, somebody who just really doesn't like you and tries to upset you all the time. But this is a heavenly adversary. Because we're being given heavenly visions here. Two people actually. Now this is an interesting glimpse into the heavenly courtroom with God as judge and somebody standing in the presence of God and somebody there to accuse this person. And this is a role that Satan reprises in the book of Revelation, um, which we can see another time. Um, but when you say there's Satan accusing, you're basically saying there's Satan Sataning because the word Satan means to accuse or to be an adversary, a legal adversary for somebody. Now, what is the nature of the accusation? Well, Joshua's the high priest. They have returned. They've been told to build the temple and to restore true worship. And they haven't succeeded properly. So Satan can stand there and go, ha, ah, look, they call, call him a high priest. Hasn't even got a proper altar. Hasn't even got a, do you see? He's not doing what he's meant to be doing properly. Or something like that. And the Lord said to the Satan, and the Lord speaks his name in the third person here. So this is quite a remarkable moment. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. 
Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? So the crux of the matter here in God's mind is Jerusalem as chosen. And therefore his will will not be thwarted. Jerusalem has been chosen. It is the choice city. Take away the verse four, the filthy garments from him. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from you and will clothe you with a change of raiment. So the high priest is essentially justified in the presence of God, by the grace of God. Now, we then get a wonderful promise, verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your fellows that sit before you. Just parenthetically, this is a very exciting phrase in the Bible. Your colleagues who sit before you colleagues who sit in the presence of the high priest that could be historically the earliest mention of the Sanhedrin that we have in the whole of Jewish history just incidentally that that you know that makes me go you that's really exciting for they are men wonder that behold I will bring forth my servant the branch so in the moment when Joshua the high priest is justified in his position and affirmed by the Lord, you get a messianic prophecy related to Joshua. And the prophecy is predicting the one who is the branch. Now I'm emphasizing this for reasons that I hope will become clear in a few minutes time. So with the Messiah, Joshua, the high priestly Messiah, Joshua, you get the prediction of a messiah to come the branch related to him somehow do you see okay for behold the stone that i have laid before joshua upon one stone seven eyes behold i will engrave the graving thereof says the lord of hosts i will remove the iniquity of the land in one day etc now this thing about the eyes as with a lot of the imagery from zechariah gets reused in the book of revelation okay eyes lampstands all this kind of thing we can explain this on another occasion i don't want to get distracted right now chapter four having discussed high priestly anointed one we now move to kingly anointed one chapter four of zechariah now i think this is one of the most humorous passages in the bible if it if you have that kind of sense of humor the angel that talked with me came again verse one and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep verse two he said unto me what do you see so you wake up what do you see so he's now seeing this vision again the prophet what do you see and i said well i've looked and behold a candlestick all of gold. <clears throat> a golden candlestick. Which is what? Piece of furniture? It, it's the menorah. Mm -hmm. What do you see? I see the menorah of gold. The golden menorah. Now keep that in mind. The first thing he sees in this passage is the menorah. Of gold. Of course it's of gold. And then he describes it with the bowl and the seven lamps and all that kind of thing. Which is how the menorah is portrayed. And then there are two olive trees beside the menorah. Verse 3. One on the right and the other on the left. Now, opening your eyes and seeing the menorah. Yeah. He's a prophet. He's, he's Jewish. He understands what the menorah is. <coughs> Well, what's with the two olive trees? <laughs> Do you ever see two olive trees beside a menorah? Of course not. So his reaction is actually quite natural. Verse 4, I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Adoni, what are these? Which is a reasonable question. Now the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Don't you know what these are? No, my lord. And then the angel proceeds to completely ignore the question. <laughs> Ratcheting up the tension as the passage continues. So, oh, this is strange. What are those? Don't you know? No. 
Oh, well, never mind. And on we go. Verse 6. Then he answered and spoke to me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. So we're now on to the kingly Messiah figure. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I love those words. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, this restoration from exile, your ability to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild its walls, rebuild the temple, reconstitute proper worship, it's not going to happen because you're strong. It's not going to happen because you've made it happen. In fact, it's happening because a pagan Gentile king has been moved by my Holy Spirit to let you do this. So you can't take any credit for this. Now I'm going to read this in the King James. We'll come back to this next phrase in a moment. He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. Now we'll come back to that in a moment. And again the word of the Lord, verse 8, came to me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. He will also finish it. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who has despised the day of small things? They shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Again, we had that before to do with the high priest. Again, it comes up later in Revelation. Now we get back to what we were talking about. Then I said, <laughs> what are the two olive trees? <laughs> Don't you know what they are? No, my Lord. Finally, we get the answer. These are the two messiahs, the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So the two olive trees are the high priest and the political leader, the descendant of David. They are Joshua and Zerubbabel. Now, these two occur in the book of Revelation. We'll see that in a little while. Now, I want to go back to that mysterious phrase at the end of verse 7. And this is serious. It's so serious I've made notes. Verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, a plain? And then, literally, and he, now that has to be Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel shall bring forth the headstone. Zerubbabel shall bring forth the headstone. Now remember in the previous chapter, we had Joshua the high priest will bring forth my servant the branch. So we have the high priestly Messiah figure who shall produce the branch. By the way, who is Christ? As branch. Okay, this is elsewhere in the prophet's book of Isaiah especially. So the high priest shall bring forth Christ as the fulfillment of the high priestly Messiah figure. And then the same terminology is then used here in chapter 4, verse 7. The descendants of David Zerubbabel shall bring forth the kingly Messiah. Do you see? Both of them into Christ. And he's described, so he shall, he, Zerubbabel, shall bring forth the headstone. In Hebrew, ha-even haroshah, because even is actually feminine. Stone is feminine. So, ha-even haroshah, the headstone, the top stone, capstone, okay, Christ. And then it says, literally, shouts of, so he shall bring forth the headstone, which is Christ, shouts of, Grace, grace unto it. Now, the problem is in Hebrew, there is no it because there's no neuter. In Hebrew, everything is either him or her, she or he. It's all masculine and feminine. So it's literally shouts of grace, grace unto her in this verse. Grace, grace unto her. They're shouting out grace, grace unto her when the heads. And you look at this and go, well, who's the her? 
Who is the her that's having the shout of grace? It cannot be Jesus. No. Because Jesus is not the recipient of grace. Do you see? So, mm, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. There's a grammatical way of doing this. We do not have to guess. You just have to learn Hebrew. <laughs> I jest, I jest. So you, you're looking for something feminine. Now, the previous feminine word is stone, but that produces a logical problem. The stone is Christ, and Christ is not going to receive grace from anyone. So then you have to find the previous feminine word in this passage. And it so happens that we do have another feminine word in this passage. We've mentioned it already. Menorah. Because the prophet was asked, what do you see? And he was like, it's the menorah. There she is. The menorah of gold. Grace, grace unto her. Now just think about that for a moment. <laughs> Let me let's get distracted. Just have some fun with this. Um, stone. Why it can't be the st can't be the stone receiving the grace because explicitly the stone, the headstone, the capstone is always Christ. The New Testament does this explicitly. Um, but what I want to do. Remember, I was talking about your three columns: universal covenant, peculiar covenant, and new covenant. Right. And I said, you can take a theme in the Bible and you can apply it covenantally. Let's think for a moment about Christ as stone and what that means for each of the three covenants and see what results we get. Let's see where this takes us. A little adventure. This is all parenthetical. I just let's get sidetracked for about 10 minutes or five minutes. Gentiles, Jews, and Christians. Let's start with Gentiles. What does Christ represent as stone to the Gentiles? Not to Gentiles. Not to Gentiles. Those are the two other covenants you've just mentioned. <laughs> no, that's... Mm. Christ as stone to Gentiles, I think the best illustration is the one we mentioned earlier, Daniel chapter 2. Because that statue is all the Gentile nations going all the way back to Babylon as the head. All right, And at the end, it's smashed by the little stone that appears cut out without human hands. In other words, it's of divine origin. Christ as stone is the stone that smashes all human attempts at ruling themselves and sets its own kingdom up on earth. And it's under the Christ, the stone, that the Gentiles will finally have proper government. Peace and prosperity for all under the rule of Jesus. That is Christ, the stone for the Gentiles. The overthrow of Gentile power, but the benefits of all the Gentiles living under Jesus' rule in the millennium. Way, isn't that great? Right, right. Now let's think about the next covenant, the covenant with the Jews. And we, this was mentioned. So Romans chapter 9, verses 32 to 33. Why? Verse 32. Why? You can tell I'm coming in in the middle of something. <laughs> Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offence. You see? So the stumbling stone motif is Christ as stone to the Jews. Now, if that were the whole story, that would be quite miserable. So we're going to come back to this in a bit. But, yeah, Christ as stumbling stone to the Jews. Now, what about to believers? I'm going to give you a few references here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. These are all taken completely out of context so in your own time you can read the context and make sure i'm not murdering these verses okay. built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ himself being the chief cornerstone 1 corinthians 10 verses 1 to 4 
Moreover, brethren, I would not that have you be ignorant that how all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Do you see? And actually, this is the whole imagery, as you know, of why he shouldn't have struck it twice. Yeah? Okay. Going back to Exodus chapter 17. Also, John chapter 4, verses 13 to 14. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, about the water that comes out of the stone being the Holy Spirit. That link is explicitly made. All of this is very, very well known. Christ as stone in all three covenants, right? Uh, John 7, 37 to 39. Yeah. Now, Zechariah back chapter 4. Who art you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you're a plain. And Zerubbabel will bring forth the headstone. In other words, just as there will be a descendant of Joshua the high priest, who will be the branch, Christ, there will be a descendant of Zerubbabel, and this time it's actually after the flesh, because Zerubbabel is mentioned in, I think it's Matthew. Um, yeah, Matthew chapter 1, verse 13. Verses 12 and 13. Zerubbabel is mentioned in the ancestry of Jesus. So Zerubbabel will bring forth the headstone, Christ. And when he is brought forth, there will be shouts of grace, grace unto her, the menorah. And the menorah symbolizes Israel. Do you see? In fact, if you even go on the Wikipedia... <laughs> <laughs> you don't get your doctrine from Wikipedia, obviously. But if you were to go on Wikipedia, there's even like a, a website devoted to the menorah as symbolizing Israel, which is why it's on is Israeli coins. It's why prime ministers have referred to Israel as the menorah, because Israel is meant to be a light unto the Gentiles. Do you see? A light unto the nations. Now, think about where the menorah was kept in the tabernacle. It was not in the most sacred space. It was the other side of the curtain. Do you see? Because it's only once Christ has died that you can go through into the most holy place. You get lampstands in the book of Revelation that represent the church, the various churches. You know, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove my lampstand comes the warning and those lampstands are in the very presence of god because they're the church lampstands but in this covenant the menorah is just one degree of separation away with the, re the veil between yeah and the lights on the menorah never go out right so israel is never extinguished do you see the light always shines and it's Israel that, remember, and we'll come on to a nice illustration of this in a moment. Daniel, here we go. Chapter 5. Belshazzar the king. Actually, he's not the king. He's the um, crown prince. The king is Nabonidus. Nabonidus is off in the desert doing weird things. Fighting the Persians as well. Getting strangely devoted to the moon god. So Belshazzar the king, he's the crown prince. But he's been left behind as king in Babylon. Which is why Daniel later on can only be offered the third station in the kingdom. Because Belshazzar himself is second. Okay. Now Daniel by this point is a very old man and he's long retired. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. And he drank wine before the thousand. Now if, that's, if that was all he did that would have been fine. Have a big party. Drink some wine. Be a bit leery. No problems. But Belshazzar... Now, my translation says whiles he tasted the wine, but that's really poor. It's, um, I actually, this is, this passage is written in Aramaic and I teach this to my students in Aramaic. Um, it's by reason of the wine, under the influence of the wine, he does what he's about to do. So Belshazzar, because of the wine, on, under its influence, commanded to bring, and it shows how ignorant he is, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels that his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Now, what's the problem with that command? 
where when we see it fulfilled, verse 3, then they brought the golden vessels that were taken from the temple. Do you see the difference there? There were no silver vessels in the temple in Jerusalem. He hasn't got a clue <laughs> what he has in his own palace. <laughs> Do you see? So he's drunk. He says, oh, bring all that gold and silver stuff we plundered from the temple of the Jews. And you can imagine the servants rolling their eyes and going, the man has no idea. Just bring the gold. <laughs> and then out they come. In order that the king and his princes, and then this is kind of tidied up a bit in English. My translation has his wives and his concubines. Basically um, talking about temple prostitute. So we're not just having a drunken party. We are having an orgy. Now, that's all well and good. You want to do that? Fine, do that. But then to bring the holy vessels from the temple. And it says, verse 4, they praise the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone. In other words, it's not just an orgy, but it's an orgy in which they're taunting the God of Israel with his vessels, saying, look, we're going to use them to worship our gods. Again, like what the Philistines did, putting the Ark of the Covenant in front of their god it's a sign of all oh, we've we've beaten them our god's better than theirs and this is the demonstration of the humiliation of the god of israel do you see and he should have known better because of his grandfather nebuchadnezzar that's the point yeah at that very moment verse five came forth the fingers of a man's hand now where did it write well it wrote beside the candlestick this is in aramaic so it's, it's the word is not menorah because that's a hebrew word but it's the aramaic word that equates to the menorah it's actually a word of persian origin it's a very nice word i think it's persian origin so the the there is the menorah in the midst of all this debauchery that's going on and idolatry and everything else there is the menorah and it's shining its light onto the wall where the plaster is which then allows them to see the writing that's written there do you see israel light to the nations do you see when the romans conquered jerusalem later on after christ had died and risen they carried away all the temple plunder and you can go to rome now and you can look at the arch of titus and see it depicted the menorah being carried off and that's a symbol of israel being taken off and exiled again so the menorah here in this passage is israel as light to the nations and what does the light shine on the words of god you see it's the menorah that allows the gentiles to see god's word it's Israel that gave the Bible to the world. And it's Israel who has suffered through her history because, what does she stand for? Monotheism and a higher standard of ethical behaviour, which makes everybody really angry because it's like, well, what are you telling us how to be? Do you see? And this is a beautiful example of in, all the, sen in the middle of all that wickedness that is going on, there is Israel still burning and still shining and still convicting. The nations of, of their sins. It's the menorah. So they see the writing. And the king's countenance was changed. And his thoughts troubled him. Understatement. And the joints of his loins were loosed. So he, he experienced incontinence. And his knees smote one against the other. So then they call in all the wise men of Babylon, all the administrators who also dabble in the occult and all that sort of thing. And he says he can be third in the kingdom if you explain it. And nobody can explain it. They can't even read it. And then in comes the Queen Mother in verse 10. The Queen Mother walks in. The Queen, by reason of the words of the King and his lords, came to the banquet house. I can imagine her rolling her eyes. She walks in and sees her maybe her um, grandson there 
having messed himself and a quivering wreck. And she'd known Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah? And in she comes and says, Now, there was a man called Daniel. <laughs> he used to run things when your grandfather was on the throne. Smart cookie. Paraphrasing. He knows, what, he knows what's going on. So Daniel is brought out. And... Um, can you imagine Daniel's reaction to what he sees? There's the menorah. There's all the sacred vessels. There's the remnants of an orgy and the king having messed himself. <laughs> Daniel answered and said before the king. Now, when Daniel usually answers the king, he says something like, Oh, king, live forever. And he's very respectful. Even if he's been thrown in a lion's den or something like that, he's always respectful. On this occasion, he says, keep your gifts, give your rewards to someone else. I'll tell you what this says for nothing. <laughs> Can you see? No respect here at all. He's in a really, really bad mood. Understandably. <clears throat> And he says, you should have known better because of your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, etc. And he explains about Nebuchadnezzar's temporary madness and how he was brought back. But in verse 23, you should have humbled yourself, but no, you lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. How? By bringing these vessels of his temple in your presence and doing what you've done. Daniel is hopping mad and rightly so. So I'm going to tell you what this says. He, he understood it straight away. The writing on the wall was <clears throat> pound, pound, shilling and pence. Three units of currency, three units of weighing. In Aramaic, mene, mene, tekel, which is the equivalent to Hebrew shekel, and farsin. But you can read it as pound, pound, shilling and pence. You see, and, that, and this is why they're all confused. What's going on with this? What does that mean? Ah, he says, go back to the roots of these words. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Shekel is to do with weighing. You've been weighed in the balances found wanting. Perez, to be divided. Your kingdom is divided, given to the Medes and the Persians. So he can read it and he can interpret it. And in that night, verse 30, he was slain. There wasn't even a fight the Persian army just walked into Babylon, they opened the gates for them and welcomed them as deliverers from an inept regime. The Babylonians welcomed them in. Not even a fight. So there we go, there's a lovely imagery of Israel as menorah in exile. Light to the world, that which convicts. And then you go back to Zechariah. When the headstone, when Christ is brought forth, and he'll be brought forth as branch and headstone, high priestly Messiah and kingly Messiah in one person. When this figure is brought forth, there will be shouts of grace, grace unto Israel. Remember what we read in Acts chapter 15? After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. Grace, grace unto her. You see, it all fits. Once the church age comes to an end, when Jesus is brought forth and received by his people, his people will have that grace given to them. So it's not just Christ the stone of stumbling to the Jews. That is temporary for our sakes. But it's Christ then as headstone for the Jews and how they receive their grace now just as a quick postscript I want to show you in Revelation chapter 11 which refers to the two olive trees do you see John is here behaving like Ezekiel the prophet so um, there was given me a reed like to a rod and the angel said rise measure the temple of God and the altar and those that worship in it 
but the court which is outside the temple leave out and don't measure it. It's given unto the Gentiles and the holy city they shall tread underfoot for 42 months. This is the tribulation period, three and a half years. And I will give unto my two witnesses who shall prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So as Jerusalem is downtrodden <coughs> under the Gentiles, the Jews flee into the wilderness, which we see elsewhere, but two Jews stay behind. They refuse to leave. And for that period of pretty much three and a half years, they prophesy against the Gentiles. Right. And they are described as two olive trees. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. This phraseology is coming straight from the book of Zechariah, later on in Zechariah chapter 4. So what this tells us, they're quite amazing people, because the reason they're able to stand there for pretty much three and a half years and prophesy against everybody is that anybody tries to touch them, dies. Would that be Joshua and Zerubbabel of their spirit? It's going to be whoever is the high priest of the Jewish temple and whoever is the political leader of the Jews, probably also a direct descendant of King David, because that's who they were the first time round in the book of Zechariah. So you interpret prophecy according to the pattern of the initial fulfillment. So we know, one, the temple will be rebuilt. Two, there will be a high priest there. Three, there will be a political leader of Israel who will be a direct descendant of King David. And when Israel is attacked and everybody flees, these two will be given special power by God to stand and preach to the world for three and a half years. Then they torment the whole earth with plagues. When, verse 7, they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. Well, that's because God's purposes have been fulfilled. They have spoken all that he wants them to speak. Almost. <laughs> their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord is crucified. So their bodies lie there, which is a terrible thing because you're meant to be buried very quickly if you're Jewish and they of the people verse 9 of kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half but will not allow them to be buried and they that dwell upon the earth <coughs> shall rejoice over them I think this is the sort of thing that can only happen with 24 hour global news networks because the whole in three and a half days the whole world knows you see and the whole world is rejoicing over their death but after three and a half days they're resurrected now now the the significance of this and it's the same actually with jesus in the grave it's the same with the lazarus story if you remember with lazarus it's already gone the third day um because of the rush to bury very often people would be buried alive um, by accident and so halakhically speaking in Jewish tradition um, once you've been in the grave for three days and three nights you are properly dead and they can seal it up properly and and then the burial is, is complete so these three because it's three and a half days they are well and truly dead they are legally dead there's no sort of oh maybe they were just you know sleeping no they're dead and it's a proper resurrection miracle. Same with Lazarus, same with Jesus. Um, which means that Jesus couldn't have died on Friday and rose on Sunday morning, but that's another issue. Um, the math just doesn't work. And then they're given their own little rapture experience in, in verse 12. So, so you have to understand what happened historically in Zechariah. It's fulfilled, partly, um, in terms of Joshua and, and Zerubbabel. This thing in Revelation 11 is not Enoch and Elijah. It's not Joshua and Zerubbabel. It's the high priest and the political leader of the Jewish nation. 
And that's the plain sense here. I mean, there, there is actually, as far as I can see, no other sensible way of reading this passage. Yeah, that's just what it is without adding to it. Hmm. And he closed the book. <laughs>